Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number 177. I sit here bright eyed, bushy tailed with my ever present, ever wonderful guest, uh, sorry, co host, uh, Rachel Guy. Hello. Good morning. I'm also bright eyed and bushy tailed from a very frosty London. It's very frosty here too, uh, and this is the beauty of living in the countryside. I wouldn't have it any other way. The sun's coming up over the meadow, there's frost on the grass, you can see it glistening, it's all fresh. Um, I'm just looking forward to my morning dog walk, I'm pumped. Do you know what's really funny, like when you live away and you live overseas for 10 years, obviously, lives in Australia for 10 years and he came back, oh God, how long ago did I come back? Six months ago, not even, not even, a couple of months ago, I've been back in London now. There are some things when you live overseas as an expat um, that you really miss being a Brit. Um, frosty mornings is one of them. Um, Percy Pigs from Marks and Spencers is another. Not that I actually, like the thing is with Percy Pigs, like quite frankly, I, I, I there's a part of me that feels they're overrated. But you know, every time I came used to come back to the UK, um, I would always go to Marks and Spencers. I would buy myself some new socks um, because obviously that's the only place to buy socks. And um, Percy Pigs. And what else did I miss from UK? Oh, proper PG tips. Like, you know, there's good tea around the world, but, you know, PG tips just can't beat that as a Brit. Um, frosty mornings, um, that, that cold, crisp winter. You know, when you live in a hot, sunny climate, and, you know, Sydney has, does get really cold in the summer, but um, you do you do miss it, particularly around Christmas time. I like how you went, oh, you know how you miss home when you used to live in a hot, sunny climate? No, I don't. I've never lived in Sydney. I've never <laughs> lived with sun all year round. So, no, I can't see the size of you, Rachel. Big you shout out to all Aussies who listen to the podcast. I miss Sydney so much. It's such a wonderful place to live. And okay. um, I am loving being back in the UK, though. It's... It's where I need to be right now, but I've had, you know, I've got a very soft spot and I always will for Australia. So, um, hi to all Aussies. I don't think I could live with sun all year round. I love the seasons, how it changes, how it moves, how you adapt, how your lifestyle changes, the things that you do change, like your habits. I don't know. I think it keeps fresh. Don't get me wrong, it does get cold in Australia, particularly actually one of my favourite seasons in Sydney is actually the winter time, so June, July and August are amazing months to be in Sydney because it's it's cold, so it can be anywhere anywhere from, I don't know, 2, 3 degrees right up to maybe 10 degrees, um, but most of the time in the summer it's, it's crystal clear skies and it's, it's sunny but it's really cold, so it's kind of like a little bit like... I don't know, British spring, I suppose. I think that's what we need more of in the UK when it's summer. It's actually summer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> summer, summer. Like eight but days then, across three months. Why do we always talk about the weather? Because that's such a British thing. I've been indoctrinated back into the Brit lifestyle. No more about the weather. That's boring. What else, what else is going on? Uh, not much for me. Uh, I'm really excited that I'm now training properly. Um, like last week, I sort of... You know, was able to go right. Let's let's really start training hard. So I'm enjoying that, um, and that's about it for me. Really, nothing really exciting. I've started drinking from a wine bottle because I've noticed that we go through a bit of wine at home. So you do like wine, and I've got all these glass <laughs> wine bottles sitting around. And I thought, well, it's really nice to actually drink cold, fresh water from glass. So we yeah. use wine bottles. So now I'm carrying around a wine bottle everywhere with me, and I get weird looks, but don't care. Do you know what's funny? When I when I used to run um, fox camps in Sydney, so like basically female boot camps, um, one of my girls turned up with an, an, a, a a wine bottle. It was a red wine bottle as well, so one of those green ones um, with water in. One day it was absolutely hilarious because obviously most of my girls who came to fox camp liked the odd glass of wine now and again. So we did have a good laugh about that. It's just recycling. It's green. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> and you can fill them all up and put them in your fridge. You've always got nice, cold, fresh water. Yeah, it's bonzo. Very right, nice. let's get into the show. Let's talk about health and fitness. Let's do that. So we've got a couple of questions today. I shall begin. This first one is from Tom Market. And there's two parts to this question. So we'll go through the first part and answer it, and then we'll answer the second part. Yeah. So, hi Ben and Rachel, I hope you're both okay and smashed in 2016 already. I have two questions for your podcast and I hope that you could answer at least one as they are issues that I'm currently finding. First question regarding supplementation. Ever since I was a child, I have suffered from sleep terrors. I wake up in the middle of the night screaming, shouting, lashing out, getting up, moving around and slamming doors. After going to university, I established that these became worse during periods of heightened stress. 
I found things such as caffeine had little effect on whether I would get a good night's sleep or not. What I mean by this is that I trialed cutting it out altogether and then not having it after 3 p.m., which I would never do anyway, anyway regardless of sleep patterns. I've been to the doctors for my sleep terrors and they've simply told me that I can be given sleeping pills or to attend a lengthy sleep clinic process. After changing and editing sections of my diet and stress levels, I finally managed to get my terrors under control. However, about two years ago, I, start, I started introducing magnesium to my supplementation as I heard it was great for relaxation and muscle recovery. As if somebody had flicked a switch in my brain, the sleep terrors were back in full force. I never thought this could have, have been down to the magnesium that I was taking until I came to the BTN uh, conference and spoke to one of your coaches about this. And they mentioned that in some cases, magnesium can actually cause restless sleep. I've removed it from my supplementation and I do not suffer from night terrors anymore. However, I'm now finding that I get very sore muscles and I struggle with my recovery. Is there any benefit to taking magnesium at a different time of day, for example, in the morning? Is there any supplementation that can mimic the effects of magnesium from a recovery point of view? I have done some research on this, but I can't find anything relating to the magnesium thing. It might be worth getting some blood done to see if I am actually deficient in this or not. See, this is pretty interesting. and It's obviously not something that we've talked about before. It's not something that I actually have personal experience with uh, night terrors, but the topic of magnesium is obviously fascinating. Now, most supplements work by the premise that if you have a deficiency, they will cause a positive effect. They're bridging the gap. So magnesium is something that an awful lot of people are deficient in. Um, the statistic is very high. It's about 80% in non-trained populations. Now in trained populations, that's likely to be even higher because we're depleting magnesium all the time. Now I would obviously be interested to see whether the effect changes with uh, oral and transdermal. I'm guessing that Tom hasn't tried this because he hasn't mentioned it. And, you know, I would have mentioned it if it's something that I would have tried. So that, that would be interesting for a start. But, you know, the, the magnesium is obviously having a positive effect on his recovery. As a global rule of thumb, it's not going to matter too much whether they have it at morning or at night. But saying that, if you train late afternoon and you don't have magnesium till the next day, your body during its sleep cycle where it's going to do a lot of its repair isn't going to have that sufficient level of magnesium. So it will struggle. There'll almost be a lag in recovery. And I think that you'll still get the level of soreness um, that you that you seem to get. And I'm, I'm only really saying this based on personal experience that if I train and I use uh, transdermal magnesium, I barely get sore, like ever. Now, if I don't have that and I put it on the next day, it doesn't work. It has a very short-term acute response. It's as if the magnesium wants to be in there before you undergo your sleep cycle. Now, my theory with the sleep terrors is that the magnesium is making you go into such a relaxed state that it allows the sleep terrors to kind of come back with full force. Now, most people take magnesium and get positive effects on sleep, brings down their body, brings down their stress, allows them to relax, creates a more restful night's sleep, which is perfect. But there's people that I would say that have underlying issues and this exacerbates the issues because it puts you into a deep state of stress. It's like people that go on holiday, you get so relaxed and so chilled out that you end up getting ill or you feel really tired because your body's just shut down. You put it into such a state of sleep that it, it has a greater reaction. Now, my only, and this is purely a theory, with sleep terrors, anxiety, um, you know, anything mental and even partly physical around anything that's stress or mental and spiritual related, there's got to be an underlying cause. Mm. And if you haven't been there, if you think you've been there, I would question whether you've been there in a very deep way. I mean, really, like, really got to the bottom of this stuff, had proper therapy to kind of look at why am I having online, un underlying emotions of anxiety, fear, um, you know, terror, wh whatever these emotions are kind of boiling up into. Because um, ultimately, there's, there's going to be something there. There's something in the background, and only really when your body is unconscious or in a subconscious relaxed state does it allow itself to come to fruition. 
I, I pretty much would have echoed exactly the same thing. I mean, I'm no sleep doctor and I'm, you know, I've I have no experience myself of of sleep terrors. It's the but I would have come to the same conclusion. I think really this it's the only plausible yeah. you know, rationale and you know, we mentioned it before on the podcast, if there's anything mental that you can't get to the bottom of you've got to go and see someone. And this is purely me based on me going through my own journey with having kind of therapy and stuff that the, the state of our mind and how we think about the world is an immensely powerful thing. Um, and if you don't know who to turn to, I mean, we've just, uh, I've recently recruited um, Stephen H. Stephen H has just joined the Body Type Nutrition team, an incredible mindset coach, like the testimonials this guy's getting. He's already been working with some of um, the BTN coaches uh, I know you won't mind me saying this, but Simon Herbert, one of our coaches, he um, has had a, a couple of hours with Mr. Aish, and he said, you know, how how he's so much more chilled out in just how he thinks about the world. Like his to-do list doesn't stress him out. You know, getting on top of work and stuff, it's not an issue. It's literally how you view the world. So if someone can sit down with you and tweak the way that you think, the way that you structure words the kind of emotions that you attach to situations and past practices, if you can change that, you literally rewire your brain. And it can actually happen in a very short process or period of time if you find the right person that can get to really the bottom of the issue. So I'd, I'd highly recommend um, having a look, um, sorry, looking up Stephen Aish. Um, he's, his profile is now on the Body Type Nutrition website. Um, you know, I think he could benefit a huge amount of people. If not, go and see someone local to you. Um, he's based in Cambridgeshire um, in the UK, so you can travel to him. You can have sessions on Skype or find a therapist local to you. Like I went and found someone local. Um, if I'd have known Mr. Stephen H at the time, would I have travelled for it? Yeah, like to travel for an hour or two for someone to rewire the way that I think, I think is immensely beneficial. Like I'd, I'd, tra- I'd probably travel to Scotland for the right kind of person. Because it's just that important. Here's the thing, right? I was having this conversation with, um, you know, one of my guys the other day. Like, everybody needs a coach. And, you know, it's essentially it's the same thing that we do, you know, in our Chase Life program. Um, it's, it is, it is you know, about rewiring the brain. But we, we always say, like, everybody needs a coach. I don't care how experienced you are. In fact, in fact let's take this example. And here's, here's a classic one. A lot of people say, oh, I don't need a coach. I'm fine doing what I'm doing. Well, if you want to perform at your best, you look at all the top athletes in the world. They've all got a coach. They've got a physio. They've got a trainer. They've got a coach. They've got, they've got everybody around them. So it's not just one person. It's the team. So if you think that you can do things by yourself, good luck with that because you're probably going to need some guidance along the way. And yeah, you know what? It's going to cost you. It is going to cost. And it's an investment in yourself. And so, you know, if you want... If you want the best for yourself and you want to be successful, then you have to prioritize, you know, putting some funds aside for a coach and, you know, for a trainer and, and seeking out the best that you can. And, you know, you need a coach in various different things um, throughout your life. You know, I've got various different coaches for various different things at the moment, um, you know, more business related and, you know, and, and marketing related. Um but I, you know, I saw an area in my business that I thought was well, a bit of a hole there. I need to fill that gap. Like, who do I need? Who, who what sort of person? Like, who is it that I need to find um, to help me with this? And you have to allocate the funds to it, and that's how you continually grow. Mm-hmm. And you know, when you become more experienced, it can actually, it can become more costly, and it can't. Like, yeah, it can become more costly because you need to get more experienced people quite often especially you know you just talked about on a business level if you're very experienced being self-employed you're running your own business you're going to need something more someone more experienced than you and that's going to cost but the chances are you might find that actually costs the same because you might be able to have a 15 minute call with someone on the phone Mm -hmm. and they're able to give you so much info in 15 minutes that you know it's kind of it's kind of fairly irrelevant. It's kind of it's worked itself out. When you're younger or less experienced, you need more time. You've got to sit down. People have got to spell things out more. You don't really mm. understand concepts and theories and stuff. So it can kind of all be relevant. But you know, there's there's a coach for all things, and sometimes we don't think laterally enough about our problems. You know, we always think nutrition, training. You know, there's coaches for that, great, but there's coaches for literally everything mm. in, in life. And if you're struggling with something, 
find a coach. Like coming back to the time principle, literally this week I've just um, put back on my website the ability for people to have coaching with me. So it's something that I haven't done for nearly two years now and people can now have coaching with me. You can have a one-to-one session with me on Skype. You can come to my house for an hour. You can come to my house for half a day. Um, If anyone wants to have a look, it's on bencoomba.com in the shop. And, you know, I say to people, people come to me and they're like, Ben, um, I want to start monthly coaching with you. And I'm like, you don't need it. Mm. You don't need it from me. Get an hour, maybe even half an hour of my time. Let's sit on Skype. And the reason why I say this is I'm a very experienced coach. I'm able to see around problems very quickly. And I can change an awful lot for people in the space of half an hour, 60 minutes. So people might look at my hourly rate and go, oh, Ben, you're quite expensive. And I'm like, I bet you I'm three, four, five, maybe six times more efficient than other coaches because I have the experience to get right to the heart of the problem, go for the jugular, give you an action plan, and you go away and do it. 100% agree. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, you know, I get it all the time. Like, you know, girls, they want to coach with me when I weren't. And I'm like, honestly, like, my Fed Fox blueprint is now so good. Like for the price of one, like one Skype call or one training session, I mean, you can have a whole year of your training and your, your nutrition like done for you. You don't need me. Like I'm, you know, like like you, Ben. Like I, I know what to do and I know what works. And it's you don't you don't need that. And I think what a lot of what it is is people just want accountability. And so they need, and that's what a coach is also for is accountability, somebody that you can call, somebody you can check in. A lot of people just need reassurance along the way and, you know, kind of a pat on the back and yeah, you're doing it, you're doing a good job, carry on. Rachel, let me ask you, how does accountability work for you? Because the reason why I ask is because it actually works very badly for me Mm. in that I like to create all my own rules and all my own accountability. And I know other people are obviously not like this. So in, I think at the end of December, I signed up to an eight-week program. And I knew that the first two months of the year were going to be very important for me with, with some stuff that I'm doing. And I said, right, I'm going to make myself a bit more accountable. I'm going to kind of push myself. So I signed up to this program. Now, I partly signed up to the program because I wanted to see how they did it. Uh, and there was a, a few kind of, there was at least two or three key weeks of learning that I actually really wanted to do. I felt that it was a knowledge gap for me. So I signed up and the accountability process that they're trying to instill on me has been awful because I'm not fully engaged in what the program's trying to teach me. I just want to know a couple of little bits of the program. I'm waiting for that to come around. I'll dive in and I'll learn it. But I'm very good at saying, right, today's Monday, it's the end of the day, Tuesday's tomorrow, what am I going to do tomorrow? Right, I want to achieve X, Y and Z, I write on my to-do list, I structure my day, I write in when I'm going to go to the gym and I write in when I'm going to clock off. I'm self-employed so I have to have that you know, imposed time or, or I have to do it myself. And anyone enforcing accountability on me, I, I literally just don't need it. I'm like, I know why I get up. I have a sense of purpose. I know why. I know why I'm trying to achieve things. I know the things that I have to do for others around me, my staff, my students, my clients, and and, and that's it. And sometimes I get why people want accountability, but it comes back to achieving your goals, right? If you don't have a clear why, if you wake up, if you're self-employed and you wake up and you're like, I I don't know why I'm doing it today. I, I need someone to give me a kick up the ass. I'm like, why? Mm. Why should someone else motivate you to do what you need to do on a daily basis? Okay, so I, I've got a lot to say on this topic, so I'll try and keep it brief. So um, on the t- t- topic of accountability, um, I have two things to say. First of all, um, I really, really struggle um, with finding ways to um, tick both boxes. So by that, I mean I, um, I'm i like you in the sense that if somebody – told if somebody tries to keep me accountable and told me to do something I would completely rebel against it because I'm completely unemployable I've been employable since I was 21 um I've never like I've not worked for anybody since I worked as physio um the idea of sticking to somebody else's times and rules completely and utterly um repels me um and like you I have my own goals and I set my own my own time frames on things and I get shit done and on the flip side of that, um, 
I have put accountability in place for a lot of my girls in my system for two reasons. First of all, um, accountability comes down to motivation. And motivation comes down to two things, and that's basically push or pull. So let's look at somebody who might join an online fat loss program. Most of the time, it comes from uh, push motivation, meaning that they've got themselves to a stage where they're looking in the mirror and they're thinking, God, like I'm overweight, I need to do something about it. They're, so they're being pushed to do something. What usually happens then is that they lose, they might lose a couple of kilos, they start to look a little bit better, and then that push and to, to continually to motivate themselves, to, to motivate themselves sort of dissipates. So what they really need is a, like a pull motivation. So they need something that's pulling, like a big and exciting goal and a why, which is what you and I have in business and in training, because that excites them to keep going, and that's motivation, and that creates accountability. Now, to teach somebody how to do that is a slightly longer process, and you do need steps in place. So accountability for people who are learning to create pull motivation um, in order to get them to a certain place. So an example, accountability stuff like in my program, and I've really struggled with this from a personal perspective. I've really struggled to think, okay, what might somebody need to get them from A to Z? Because I don't need it. So I've had to really try hard to think of what it might be like to be in the client's shoes. So in the Athletic Fox movement, and I'm using this purely as an example as to how my mindset has worked behind it, um, and that's that in the goal setting section, we talk about push and pull motivation. So we encourage our girls to um, create most, um, goals that are towards, their, you know, that's a big exciting goal rather than a goal of I want to lose 10 kilos because as soon as they get sort of, you know, five, six kilos lost, like that push to go further is diminished. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. And the, the second thing um, in terms of the accountability, yeah, you know, you join up my system. If you don't log in for a week, you receive an email from me saying, hey, why haven't you logged in for a week? Because let's be honest here, life gets in the way and life gets busy. And so whilst somebody is learning the process of keeping themselves accountable and working towards their goal and working towards their why, they do get little pushes from me along the way. But, but my ultimate outcome is, is that somebody always sets themselves a goal that is sexy, that is passionate, that is that's what they really, really, really want rather than focusing on what they don't want. Because so many people in this world, if you ask them, you know, if they get stuck at anything, stuck at life, stuck at business, you ask them what they want, they'll say, they'll tell you either what they don't want or they'll say, I don't know. And most people do not know what they want. So if you're stuck in any way, and if you're finding yourself not being able to keep yourself accountable for things, well, you can only blame yourself, quite frankly, because A, you don't know what you want, and B, you're not you're not being responsible for your own actions, and it's as simple as that. Mm. I think we spoke about this in the podcast, you know, a little while ago, entitled Hard Work, and that, mm. you know, one, once we identify this, and it is a true guided goal, you know, you sit there, and you're like, this is my goal, I can conjure up the emotion, it is just down to hard work and consistency. And you've yeah. got you've got to say to yourself, I, I'm in the controller seat here, I have full power and responsibility to change everything that I want to change, and it's just a decision. And the only way that that decision can be changed is via external influences, so you have to learn how to distance and remove external influences that are both uh, negative negative. Um, and not conductive to your journey and and that's the harsh reality and sometimes you know people have talked in the past about removing negative people that kind of stuff you have to it's legitimate mm -hmm. like this is you know life is about being selfish an awful lot of the time it's, it's the airplane analogy put on your mask first before you you look to help others and i think that's why i'm in a position where i'm really ready and able to help people on a very big scale now is that i've, I've worn my life mask for quite a long time now I've, I've been on my own selfish journey. Uh, I've developed a lot as an individual, both physically, mentally, uh, and emotionally. And I'm ready for a, a big platform to teach an awful lot of people because I, I'm there. And I don't believe people can really have a good, guided, kind of spiritual following, which is what a lot of people have. You look at people of influence in the world, they have such a strong grounding of themselves and of their ego that they're able to lead and help inspire others on the journey. 
And, you know, I know we talk a lot about internal inspiration, but external inspiration is very valid as well because people feel that they can resonate with that person's energy. Like, people will listen to my work. Some people will like it. Some people won't like it. It's as simple as that. Some people are ready for my advice. Some people aren't. Some people will resonate it. Some people will resonate with Rachel and not with Rachel. We look at big leaders in the world. You look at The Rock, Jamie Oliver, Richard Branson. Like I speak to people and they're like, oh, I hate Jamie Oliver. And I'm like, I love Jamie Oliver. So Jamie Oliver resonates with me. Mm. So there's, there's nothing wrong with seeing that uh, external inspiration, but it's got to connect to the internal inspiration. You can't, you can't just be guided by that. Um, and it's like, you know, looking at Jamie Oliver for myself, I connect with him on his external motivation to me because my internal is that our goals are just so, we're on the same train tracks. Mm. We're trying to achieve the same thing. He's trying to fight obesity and information in the world that is so corrupt. And I, I'm trying to do exactly the same thing. I'm just 15, 20 years behind him. Mm. I think as well, like, what's that quote that Einstein said? Something like, something around the lines of something you make something simple and it looks easy, and if it's really complicated behind the scenes, I can't remember it right now. It's, I haven't had my, yeah, I haven't had a coffee today, so I can't, I can't, I'm not quick enough to think of it yet. But, you know, you look at, um, you know, people can look from the outside at, at, you know, at what you do and, you know, with body type nutrition and, and everything that you run and, you know, people I know say the same about me. Oh, well, it's easy for you, Rachel, because you're a trainer. It's easy for you to stay in shape. It's, you know, and they, they look at the athletic box looper and think, well, it's so simple. It, you know, um, it, it might look like it was put together in a weekend. Like it certainly wasn't like there's years and years and years and years of hard work that's gone on behind that. And I don't think that's, you know, that's sometimes appreciated from on face value. You know, you look at your body type nutrition website and it's really like it's really simply laid out. Um, you know, the structure of the course, um, it's a great structure. It's streamlined. And that stuff takes years to put into practice and into place. And it can't work unless all of the I's are dotted, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. And I think sometimes that's also forgotten. Um, and it's, yeah, it's down, it's down to hard work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we di- we've yeah, digressed a little. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think with age, maturity, experience, everything becomes more simple. Like, I yeah. don't know top people doing whatever they're doing that are making the world more complicated. They've learned so much that they've identified what's actually really important. Mm. It's like, if you talk to me now about fat loss or health, or building muscle, I'll probably give people three to five things that are really important. Mm. Whereas if you'd have asked me that eight years ago, I would have gone on about all sorts of shit. Like I would have just bored you to death talking about mercury and fish and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> now I'm like, right, get your protein sorted, get your overall energy intake sorted, sleep properly, exercise intelligently, get balanced, eat loads of fruit and vegetables. You're done. I'll see you in three months. I'll give you some more tips. Yeah. And sometimes it is kind of that simple. Now I know the nuts and bolts around that could be a little bit more complicated. But ultimately, when you become experienced, things become more simple. It's like we've talked about how my training has evolved. You talked about how your training has evolved a while ago. You know, I, I, I keep my training so simple now. Like I have two core sessions, and if I can do more, brilliant. But I don't, I don't overcomplicate it. Like it's now actually a really simple process, and it, it just works. I, I feel sometimes like you know I get asked to do, you know, sem- seminars and things, and I, I feel sometimes like seriously, like do you really want me to repeat the same stuff over and over again? Because if you were to attend a seminar of mine, like I'm sure you would, you might actually be disappointed that I haven't taught you something new because quite frankly, all I'm going to do is tell you what you already know, but probably in a more simple manner. It's, it's so basic. It's so simple, but guess what? That's what works. It's as simple as that. I think if anyone is confused about what they're doing, and this is any topic in the world ever, if you're confused, don't look to overcomplicate, look to Mm. simplify. It's like, how we teach on the academy we teach you loads of complicated stuff and then at the end it's our job to boil it down into what's important so you understand all the variables but ultimately there's a there's a nut and bolt approach look at the world that we live in today the world we live in today is becoming more simple more minimal like the way the world is moving it's all apps it's like stuff on your mobile it's like how can i order a taxi in one button 
You know, look at Uber, it's dominating the world. Look at food delivery, look at knowledge consumption. Like you log onto your iTunes, you press, press play, and you get to listen to me for, you know, half an hour, an hour, and consume knowledge. Everything is becoming one button, one click. You know, how do I do it in one, two, three clicks? And, you know, if you're struggling with something, simplify. Mm. Start the basics. Shall I finish the rest of this question? Yeah. <laughs> so to continue Tom's question, <laughs> the second question. Um, I have been training in a gym for around three years now, and I can and I train regularly with my sister, who is a very qualified and experienced PT. We both train in a commercial-ish gym. My question is due to the influx of new people training in the gym after Christmas and New Year. And when, if at all appropriate, to offer advice to newcomers about form and training technique. I put myself in their shoes three years ago, and I imagine somebody coming to tell me the thing. That, sorry, uh, someone coming to tell, coming telling me that the thing that I was doing is wrong would put me off in the gym. However, some of the things that I have seen in the gym could potentially result in somebody becoming injured. The reason why I said this was the commercial-ish gym that that the the trip that I'm training at, the trainers are less than helpful when it comes to giving advice to the members. I hope, I'm hoping these questions make sense and I would love for you to answer these questions. Thanks for all the amazing work you're doing in the health and fitness industry every week. You guys continue to be an inspiration to me. I've, you've got something to listen to when you're doing your steady state. Tom. Do you know what? It's, it's kind of like anything. It's the, it's the way you go about things in yeah. life. Like, you know, I look at, you know, a skill that I'm trying to develop personally right now is better leadership. Um, you know, I have I have a team of people. I like to know how to do the right thing. And, you know, there's, there's no magic source about kind of anything when it comes to leadership, um, allowing people, you to communicate effectively to people. It's ultimately how you go about it, how you connect to that person, how you consider their emotions, how you consider their unique circumstances, the words that you might use. It's like, for example, when we teach our nutrition course, the Academy, we teach both how people would interact with someone on a one-to-one -one personal level and both on an online level. Now, we coach as body type nutrition, 95% of people online. So we've had to refine our delivery around how do you talk and communicate on a personal level to someone via email, um, via text message, that kind of stuff. Because it's less personal, right? You're not able to just sit there and talk. So, you know, this allows us to communicate because if I've got a 20 stone rugby player who's 24 in front of me, I'm going to speak to him and deliver my knowledge to him very differently if I was going to have a 40-year-old mum in front of me or an endurance cyclist of 42. Like All these different characters and people from all walks of life need to be led and educated in different ways. So if you see someone in the gym and you know they're female, 40, you can see they're struggling, you're a bit tired, a bit untrained, Think about how they would like to be communicated. Think about the emotions that are going through you know, them as they try and do that squat that they're struggling with, for example. So you need to go over there with compassion, humility, maybe tell a quick little story about how you, know, you once, you know, your knee used to hurt when you, I don't know what it is, but find a way to connect to that person. Like, no one wants to be told anything. It's like no one wants to be sold anything, but we're all looking for ways that we can help and improve ourselves. Um, you know, like I don't sit here and try and sell the academy per se. I try and give people a reason of why I can help them improve their nutrition knowledge and inspire them and improve their ability, etc. So no one, no one wants you to come up to them and say, you're doing that wrong. This is how you should do it. That creates resistance instantly. It's like I'm not going to tell you guys as podcast listeners, you're eating wrong. Go away and do it like this. It doesn't work. Whereas if I sit here and give you a reason, a story, an explanation and kind of re-educate you, you're then self-empowered and you make a decision upon yourself to go away and say, okay, this is how I'm going to change things based on the feedback and the advice that I've been given. I just, yeah, with that, I think that, I think you have to be like, 
if somebody's in their training with their headphones on and they're kind of like minding their own business, you wouldn't want to go and tap them on the shoulder and say, hello, you're doing this wrong. You know, if somebody is kind of like looking a little bit lost, if you happen to make eye contact with them, yes, you can potentially go up to them and ask what they're training for. Um, but you've got, you've got to be very certain in yourself. Like you've got to, you know, Personally, do I approach people in the gym? No, I don't. Um, you know, I, I often get talking to people in the gym um, because usually I'm the only chick on a weight room floor, so people want to know what I do. Um, but, you know, I do see some girls in a weight room sometimes and, um, you know, quite often I'll, I'll make eye contact and I'll smile at them and then, you know, if I see them with their headphones off, I'll say, oh, what are you training for? And that's, you know, so it's it's never a direct... Um, uh, comment on somebody's form. Um, unfortunately, in the gym, it's a very precious environment. You know, people are very protective and very. Uh, people always feel very self conscious in the gym. Look, I've been lifting since I was thirteen years old. Every time I walk into a new gym, like I don't, you know, I have to like I walk around, I suss everything out, I have to know where everything is, and. You know, I was I was in a gym the other day actually, and um, I happened to be um, I was working in between a leg press and the lap, the plate loaded lap pull there, and they were next to each other, and the gym was quiet, and this group of guys came in the gym, um, like four guys, and uh, they wanted to use the plate loaded lap pull there, and I had three sets left, and they were hanging around, and I didn't know they wanted to use this plate loaded lap pull there. They were just hanging around and like staring at me, so I pulled my headphones off. I said, I said. Yes, what well, I basically said, yeah, yeah, what do you want? I made some kind of gesture as in, like, what the fuck are you looking at me for? Um, and then one of, them, <laughs> one of them said, Oh, um, how many sets have you got left? And I was like, On what? And then I, I know I had a bit of an attitude, but I was like, You know, these guys were clearly lurking, like, obviously wanting something, and not one of them had the guts to come up and say to me, Oh, you know, how many sets have you got left on the plate? No, the lap pull down. So they made me feel really awkward. So, me being me, I started to get pissed at that. Instead of feeling intimidated and just leaving the gym, I got pissed. Um, so I basically said, you know, what are you after? And they said, well, how many sets do you have left on the, the lap pull down? And I was like, I've got three sets. And one of them kind of like stood back as in, well, like she's got three sets left. You mean? And I said, well, you can work in with me if you want. You know, I had like 25 kilos on the side of the lap pull down. It was like a decent warm up weight for them. And I said, um, I said, you can warm up, you know, work in if you want. And they were like, oh, well, there's four of us. I was like, four of you. And I just put my earphones back in and I continued on my thing. Anyway, um, you know, and I thought about that afterwards. And like, anyway, we left. I ended up chatting to them afterwards and stuff. I were nice enough guys. But just that, and I'm sure it wasn't, they didn't mean to have that sort of attitude and that intimidating way about them. But they did. Had I been any other chick and not experienced in lifting weights, I would have been intimidated on the, on the weight room floor. As it happened, I just got pissed instead. I actually had a really good workout. Um, but, you know, it's intimidating. Gyms are intimidating environments, particularly for women and for men who are not experienced lifters. So I think we always have to be mindful of that and just just be friendly to people, you know? Like, you don't have to be going giving advice to people. Just be friendly because as soon as somebody feels comfortable with you, I can guarantee you they will ask for advice. I um, don't want to labor on about this too much because i think we talked about this recently but i made a post in uh the uk pt's facebook page which is a facebook page for personal trainers and um as a whole on facebook it can get quite negative quite quickly mm. and this is why people dislike social media anyway i was talking um to a colleague and you know it's a well-known colleague um and this colleague said i feel like I can't post in this Facebook group. I feel like I'm going to be judged, like people mm. are going to have a go at me for my lack of knowledge and stuff. And I thought that's a really sad mm. thing to contemplate, that we've created an environment that's actually not that supportive. Mm. Like people are scared to ask a question of why. Like people create these Facebook groups to help. Like we've got one body type nutrition community, which for our, it's for our students and clients. And... You know, we want a 100% supportive community in there. And if anyone says even a slightly like negative, derogatory, like, why are you doing this, you know, whatever um, kind of tone, I'm straight in there and I'm like, that's strike one. You've got hmm. one left and then you're out. Because I, I'm not here to belittle people on their lack of knowledge. Hmm. I've got a podcast that helps educate people. But, you know, we've, we've got this kind of culture 
where people want to use their ego to make people feel inferior. Look at me, look at my knowledge. But, you know, this is how people get put off. Like people are scared shitless to go in gyms. They don't want to go in mm. gyms. And we go in gyms and then there's the big guy who's on the bench press. And you're like, oh, how many sets have you got left? And I'm like, well, yeah, I've got four sets, like whatever. Why don't you offer to help him work in? Why don't you have a look at his technique? Why don't you make a friend? Like we, we, we can become so isolated, so mm. selfish, so driven. Uh, and I'll be honest, I have to double check myself on this because I'm quite, you know, when I go into the gym, I want to be there. Like, I want to get in, get out, get it done, train. And I have to double check myself. It's something that I have to actively kind of correct. That If someone comes over and they're like, oh, how long have you got left? I'm like, oh, you know, oh, why don't you work in with me? Let's squat together, you know, you know, whatever. And, and I, it's not my gut reaction. I'll be honest. My gut reaction is to kind of say three, three sets. I'll be done in six minutes, put my headphones on and carry on. Um, and I have to remember how people feel immensely alienated. Like the fitness industry has been built around abs, tits, good asses, all that kind of stuff. People already feel it's immensely unachievable. Like people will look at Rachel, I know, and go, I cannot achieve that physique. That's a, you know, it's a lovely physique and part of Rachel's business is built on her body, which is, you know, 100% credit where credit is due. But people are looking at that and already feeling intimidated. Yes. And if people with the great bodies are like, get out of my face and have got that attitude around imparting knowledge onto others, then we can't expect a healthier nation. We're all here to combat obesity, get people fit, educate, nourish, include, but there's not many of us that are actually doing it effectively enough. Tate, oh, I'm not going to even go on to Instagram. I won't say the S word. Um, <laughs> but it's true. Like if you, you know, I think if you, you know, if you've got a, a decent rig, then you've got to help others. It's not about, you know, you shouldn't be intimidating others. You should be helping others. Despite the fact I probably did intimidate the shit out of these four guys who were waiting for my plate-loaded lap pull down. Um, that's irrelevant. They were trying to intimidate me first. So I was peacocking. Um, <laughs> ruffling my feathers. <laughs> Um, anyway, we've got one more question. Do yes. you want to finish this one or should we save it? Should we do uh, it? Is it quick? Yeah. I've got a few things to say on it, but uh, yeah, they're pretty... I can let's be brief. Yeah, let's go. Okay. So um, this question is from Helen. Dear Ben, I believe I have a question that you may not have covered before or not in much depth. I started Olympic weightlifting almost a year ago. I came from figure competing... I came from a figure competing background um, that drove my body and self-esteem into the ground, hence why I chose weightlifting. Lots of eating and nobody cares what you look like. I have a history of depression and anxiety. The anxiety runs in my family and I'm doing all I can to prevent me from going down this path, path from going down the path, going down the path that is even further. No. Do you know what? I really need a coffee this morning, don't I? <laughs> um, <laughs> however, this is affecting my lips. I feel positive and I love my sport and I compete for a university in their master's category. However, I lack the power to nail my lifts. I need that focus and the drive that I need to develop the power. Um, I'm not an angry person, uh, but I need the fire in my belly and I don't know how to find it. I'm surrounded by some of the best lifters in the country, British champions in the sport, as well as, as, well as other well-known Olympic athletes. I've seen a sports psychologist who advised me to imagine that a family member is under the bar and I need to get them off. Yep, this didn't even work. My question is to how do, how do I start to develop a mindset of an athlete for a sport that you have chosen? How do, how do you start to dig deep and find the power within you? I'm not feeling because I'm not strong. I have a 70 kilo back squat, 55 kilo front squat and a 90 kilo deadlift, which has probably gone up, gone up um, and I haven't tested my 1RM for a while. I am hard on myself. I know this. And I'm working I'm working on it. But I need to find that anger to help me nail my lifts. Thank you. You said okay. you had a lot to say. <sighs> okay. So um, I guess uh, the, the first thing, like I've just made a couple of notes here. Um, the first thing that I'll say is that, like, why are you doing this? You know, again, like we go back to that push and pull motivation that I talked about earlier. Like, why are you doing this? Are you competing 
in powerlifting because you think it's a sport so it's pushing you away from figure and so like you want to you're basically telling me that you're running away from um you know your body issues and the self-esteem issues that uh, figure competing gave you and you think that weightlifting I'm just throwing this out there like this might not be true but you're you've chosen weightlifting because you said it involves lots of eating and nobody really cares what you look like. Well, essentially, all that's telling me is that you're not particularly inspired by the sport and you're just basically running away from something else. So it's a push motivation. Um, and the second thing is, um, you know, it's like if you, if, you, if you want to make it into a pull motivation, like what is it that you want to have more of, do more of, or experience more of as a result of your lifting? So instead of thinking of it as, um, oh, you know, I, you know, I, I don't want to have this, these body issues and I don't want anxiety anymore. Well, what do you want more of? You know, and it might be that you want more confidence. You want to be um, more self-assured and, and you want to um, feel um, calm and assertive in particular situations. So these are the things that you want more of and these are the things that you have to think more of. Um, that was the first thing I thought. The second thing was um, you said that you need to find the anger within yourself that helps you nail this. You, you don't need anger. Well, you might do. What you need is a peak state. So you need to get yourself into a state that assists your lifts. If, if powerlifting or weightlifting is your chosen sport and that's what you love, genuinely love doing from a pull perspective, from a pull motivation perspective, then you need to find a peak state. Now, for some people, that's happiness. Sometimes that's um, excitement. Um, sometimes yes sometimes that's anger but whatever it is is that it's your peak state don't necessarily think that it's an angry state just because that's what your colleagues use for you it might be a really happy state it might be an excited state it might be something else but it doesn't necessarily need to be anger um so those are like my two quick fire thoughts on that question yeah i don't think anger has a lot to do with training like i trained yesterday and i trained with quite a bit of aggression quite a bit of power, I was really driven by it, I was excited to be in the gym and it was a good session, yes. whereas last Wednesday I turned up, I was really chilled, um, you know, I didn't I didn't go through the motions but I just, I kind of just sailed through my workout, I enjoyed it, um, but I still made the same progress, yes. I was still, my head was still in it, I just went into the gym in a different state, so I didn't have to be angry because my sense of purpose in the gym was well defined, I knew why I needed to be there. Or wanted to be there so I didn't I didn't need to conjure up some kind of false emotion to get me through it if I get to that state for me personally I've either lost my way with my training or I just need a little break I'm just mm. a little bit kind of a burnt out um, just need a couple of days off maybe a week off now for me part of what needs to tie this together and I don't think we've quite talked about it in this way yet is um, a false sense of identity mm. in the Helen has moved from one side of the sport, which creates a very strong identity. And this is this is my problem a lot with the bikini and competing side of the world, that people live by that identity. Like, what do you do? Oh, by day I'm a van driver, but I'm a bodybuilder and, you know, I eat six meals a day and I need to go to the gym at five o'clock and I take my pre-workout then. And it, this kind of identity that defines someone mm. rather than... The, that that being a part of your identity so for me it almost feels like Helen has just switched sports to find a new identity which fits with the way that she should be doing things she might have been told Helen you need to eat more you're too low in your weight you need to be stop so concerned with body composition you need to lift for power and strength rather than hypertrophy Guess what? Go and try weightlifting. This is exactly what everyone does in weightlifting. And it's just a shift of identity. I'm now defined by the fact that I can eat a lot and be a bit more fat and I train for strength. But I've still got this consistent training program and I need to do X, Y, and Z and I'm doing my periodization like this, etc. It seems like a shift of identity. So, you know, and, you know, I'm not a massive fan of buying into sort of family genetics and traits. Mm. Like there's loads of stuff, like arthritis is in my family. Give a fuck, I'm not getting arthritis. I'll tell you now, I don't care if it's in my family. Like it's just, I'm not gonna define myself in any way by something that's in my family. My health is in my control. Now don't get me wrong, there are some mm. things that are genetic, 
And if it if it's in my DNA and I'm going to get it, then I'm going to get it, whatever. And I'll deal with it in the appropriate way. But you know, I'm not. You should not let anything define you like that. And something like anxiety for me would indicate that people are not 100% comfortable with themselves. There's a lack of purpose. There's a lack of why. There's a lack of understanding and loving who you are as a person. And that while training can give us some form of identity, like rugby gives me a certain form of identity, the way that I do things, the way that I play, um, it's not really an identity. It's what resonates most with my character and what I want from my sport and from my training. So I think there needs to be a massive amount of groundwork done here mentally. I think if anything, um, we talked about Stephen H earlier, like Helen, I'd, I'd highly recommend you have a chat with Stephen, have a look at kind of how your mind's thinking about things because I just, I, I can't answer your question because I don't think it's the problem. And how often do we get that, you know, like, again like before before we even started recording on this podcast you know we were talking about the questions that kind of come in like I certainly get them I know you get them on a literally a daily basis people think the problem is one thing but it's not it's totally something else and more often than not and this is which is why Ben and I have gone down this more of the mindset route over the past sort of six months you know, you've brought on a coach, like, you know, I've set up a, you know, the mindset, like more of a mindset body transformation program with Chase Life is because the problem is very, very rarely training your nutrition. The problem is you mm. and what's going on in your head. That's the problem. The rest is easy. Yeah. And it sounds horrible to say it, but it's, it's just the reality. Like yeah. we are who we are um, and we either need to take steps to fix it or we need to embrace it and run with it. It's, it's two options. Um, and that's why acceptance for what is, is really important. And this is why I value self-awareness. Um, this is why I love the work of Gary Vaynerchuk so much. He talks about Gary uh, self-awareness loads. And I think if you can get to a point where you're totally aware of your character's strengths, weaknesses, who you are, what makes you tick, Amazing. Like I, I've shared with the podcast listeners so many times what people could view as weaknesses of me. And I don't feel vulnerable telling you that I've got certain, you know, we'll call them character weaknesses. Um, they, that, that's just my personality. And the important thing is, as I'm aware of it, I know how to circumnavigate it to almost turn it into a positive or a neutral. And I don't let it become, you know something that leads me down a negative path. And as soon as you can kind of identify this stuff, I, I just believe there's a whole world of power ahead of you, an opportunity. Um, you know, it's like our body. We're all different. I've got a different shaped ass to the next guy. And if I want to change it, there's only a certain amount I'm going to be able to change it. Like I look at my physique right now after 10 years of training, there's only a certain amount it can change. So I can look at the guy down the road who looks jacked and mega athletic and alpha and I could sit there and go, do you know what, I'd love to look at that guy, but the reality is I'm not going to, unless I maybe take some, you know, some neutricals that I wouldn't <laughs> take. But the point remains, there's, there's a certain amount you can achieve and the rest of it, it's not, ex acceptance isn't about giving in. No. It's not about saying, oh, I've just got to accept what is. Yes, you have to be um, accepting of what is, but you have to embrace that. It's yeah. you. You are a beautiful person. You are an incredible being just like the next person. I think I said, like, I had a conversation in my Third Fox forum about this the other day where, um, you know, one of the girls was talking about her legs and she, you know, she was like, oh, I'm losing weight everywhere, but, like, you know, my legs aren't leaning out. When, in fact, let's be honest here, they were. Um, but in her mind, they weren't... Um, I think in her mind, she had an unrealistic expectation of what they wanted. She wanted her legs to look like the real. And I used myself as an example. And I just said, look, you know, the reality is, is that no matter how hard I trained or how much I dieted, my legs would never look like. Uh, let's think of this. Uh, a skinny model um, and like Kate Moss for example you know my legs would never look like hers and quite frankly I don't want them to but if I wanted like you know she would be an example of somebody who I'm never going to look like you know she's like five to ten inches taller than me she's very slim um I'm never going to look like that so you have to be realistic 
on what you want to look like. Similarly, if you are of a very tall, of a very tall, slight, um, and tiny build, you're never going to look like somebody who's um, like a Brazil, like with these Brazilian like chicks who've got like really big quads and a big ass and like thick, dense muscle. You're never going to look like that. Like, be realistic. And this is the issue that I have with people saying, oh, well, um, so-and-so's got an amazing body, I want to look like that. Well, guess what? You're never going to look like them. You're just going to look the best version of yourself. Yep. Anyway, so, they'll, yeah. they'll go into another rant, so maybe we should end here. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's wrap that up today. Um, let's, let's, let's call that the end of the show. Um, yeah, look, just one last thing from me, and that just don't let fitness create your identity. Like, fitness is just something that is part of us, part of something that we love. Like I love rugby, I love the banter, I love the, you know, kind of extremeness of the sport. It's very physical, I love the competitive nature, but, you know, it doesn't define me. Um, mm. Like, if it left my life, I would be sad, I would miss it, but it, it would not It would not be a, you know, a big part of me that would um, kind of depart. I would know how to kind of fill that in a different way um, I'd maybe take up, God knows, cycling, gymnastics, who knows. Um, but yeah, don't let fitness define you. Right, uh, thank you very much for listening. I will be on the podcast next week with Brad Schoenfield. We'll be talking everything to do with hypertrophy and the science behind hypertrophy in its current state. And then me and Rachel will be back on the show the week after that. So good, goodbye, everyone. Be awesome. Uh, Bye. Have fun. Uh, and we will see you next week. Ciao. Ciao. Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 176. Now, if you remember, on episode 173, 